future is now. This channel is now sponsored by PCVWay, the first company to receive the original Limitron stamp of approval, something I just made up. PCVWay makes me feel like I have a dedicated machine shop. When I need circuit boards, sheet metal, 3D prints and instrument plastics, clear resin, or even freaking metals, PCVWay has it covered with quick production and shipping times. So you should use them whenever you need high quality custom components. I'm grateful that I could land a sponsor with a big name like PCB. After nine months of consistent work and countless dollars spent, I'm now closer than ever to releasing the entire design as free and open source. I've dumped thousands in prototyping materials and like $5 trillion worth of my time. So please help me out on Patreon. Shout out to Luna Umbra, my first patron. Luna is one reason why this video is here today, so be like Luna and back this channel in a real tangible way. In the last video, we left off without such vital parts as uh, wires and electricity. Well, I'm just gonna shove all this crap in here, good enough for a video. Small stuff. So, how did I take it from a video prop into a prop gratuitous printer? Previously, I have mentioned that one of the last true requirements was to tame the savage heat coming from the motors, and for that, exposing their naked bodies to the outside air provided some natural relief. Definitely the best way to word that sentence. I had one more trick, which was simply lubrication. With the motors stripped naked, I figured all I had to do to get it to print in the state was to put in wires. The wire channels and some of the features I intended to add and cost savings I wanted to make were all not going to be as easy as they should, which I knew was a sign to stop and think. In the last prototype, I had been printing the bottom plate with this side facing the build plate so that the y-axis rail would be sitting atop a surface that was as flat as the build surface. And I thought this was overflowing in big brain engineering sensibilities, but that meant I couldn't implement any of the stuff I wanted. So I just tried flipping it. And then the design started designing itself, which is exactly what you wanna see when you're designing. You wanna see your earlier decisions pay off. First, I made the attachment point for the Z axis, previously the aluminum Z block, part of the unibody, taking out some of that all metal spine that I praised in the first video. Now, I knew there would be a strength issue, but I felt like it could work. So what we have here is a simple cantilever. So if we integrate it into the plastic, uh, the cantilever will start at the bottom and be fully supported until the 20 millimeter mark. And the same mark on the aluminum Z-Block was only 12.5. Moving your grip up for a mechanical advantage is key. The new geometry, regardless of material, cuts the torque in half. But there's so much more to it. I also realized building in simple screw holes would allow me to thread in screws to stiffen it up and borrow the strength of the metal. That's a cool strategy. The screws are also doing double duty as rigid surfaces for the Z-Rail to sit against, adding back some of that metal spine. Taking a look at the end result, I think I'm gonna call it the aluminum Z block is cooked. More shavings complete, no compromises made. Nice. Another thing is the addition of the uh, Y end stops, which are simply extruded from the main body. Another change is there's no more trimming of the Y axis. The rail just slots right into the cavity, making assembly easy. Oh, and speaking of modifications, there's no longer any drilling of the Z axis rails. Less metal cutting is great, but if you already modified your rails, don't worry, it's fine. It was also trivial to add stiffeners around the uh, Y axis, bulking up its thinnest point, and the cavities for the PSU and the SKR Pico have a bottom to them, which solves the whole naked high voltage circuit board issue. And I changed the wire channels, uh, trapping your wires to having them on the top surface so you can gut your lemon charm without soldering that. So easy. All of this just from fixing one bad decision. What better way to tell you're onto something than when things just start going your way? 
Well, there was still a fight I had to win. I had extended the top plates to account for wire channels, which meant I also had to move the extruder from the left of the motor shaft to the right side, where there was almost no space. I made a lever inspired design, which looked sexy, but it held tension like three millimeters of plastic. This design would only work in metal. I was particularly proud of this revision, which used an eccentric cam inside the bearing to make the lever arm super compact. I made a hole in the motor and tapped it, and uh, that stripped out. It was clear that I needed to learn something from the original design. Pointing the spring at the shaft puts the extruder in compression, which is the best. I just redesigned the old tensioner with a smaller bearing, and now I feel like a real engineer. The top plates have also received some work. The previous prototype required drilling into the sidewall of the Bowden tube, but in practice, the hole was nasty, which is now solved with exactly what 3D printers do best, making cool meandering internal features like an integrated filament path. I did leave 10 millimeters of Bowden tube in the inlet, so you can have a reverse Bowden tube or simply a PTFE inlet. Next on the agenda, which is finding some way to cool the electronics. The cool fan grills are now gone and in their place are two slots for two fans. These weak fans seem to do the trick, but they only cool the electronics and not the motors. I've already solved that issue, but for this prototype, I just pointed a fan at the extruder motor. Bruh. What happens without the fan? Well, the extruder rises to 60 degrees Celsius and the shaft eventually gets hot as well. And at that point, you risk buckling the filament in the extruder. This doesn't always happen, but I'm trying to build a reliable printer and this isn't acceptable. Not to worry, I have two ways to fix this in time for the open source announcement. After wiring it up for the third or fourth time, it was finally time to print a Benji. Or so I thought. It took days, yes, days, to set up the software, consulting multiple people, mastering Clipper, and then when I finally hit print, only a quarter of a Benchy printed, and then it kept moving, looking like it was printing, but no filament was coming out. I tried a few times, I would cut the filament and reload and always get another quarter Benchy. I confirmed it was clogging. I ordered a new hot end, another quarter Benchy, Posted on forums and I bought an upgraded bimetallic heat break, another quarter benchy. I accidentally broke it in half and I ordered another one and another quarter benchy. Oh my God, weeks have passed. I've grown a beard. My resolve was not deterred though because I could tell I was on the precipice of printing. The printing press. I had also been in contact with Nomad from the Positron team. He let me know that LDO was gonna ship hot ends to KB3D.com to sell, but they'd be expensive and he wasn't sure about the final price. Well, I was not too happy about that. I always have you in mind, but once I got the hot end, my mind was changed. I could see the quality practically emanating from its construction and I got to work. The dimensions were completely different, so I began to cook up my own tooling, this time filled with motivation as I had the new LDO hot end. Two weeks later and I had it perfected. Five millimeters slimmer than the Journeymaker tool end, pro position optimized, cooling optimized, 3D layer stackage optimized. It's the smallest positron style tool in, and if anyone's curious, it weighs 118 grams, which I'm told is pretty good. The Positron 90 hot end is priced at $75, making it the single most expensive item. While I was waiting for parts to arrive, I also took care of one other thing that was a showstopper, which was the wobble on the bed fork. Now, I had already gone and redesigned them, seeing as I felt it was self-explanatory that the bed forks should attach to the carriage and not some flimsy 3D printed bracket. My replacement design did exactly that, and it was of course Limitron style 3D printed with embedded screws for reinforcement. But we have to talk about geometry for a second. For all the rigidity in the arms themselves, none of it mattered because the torque from the embedded stiffening screws had no clear link to the metal carriage block, except through the plastic and the sheer distance between the big screw and the little screw was too much. At this point, I was so close to printing and I had a tool in that was begging to see some action and all that was holding it up was just to have these forks made of metal. 
So I threw in the towel and I had this piece machined. And I knew it would push the project forward, even if it was predestined to become trash once a better solution was found. With my clogs solved and my bed forks made of aluminum, I resumed testing. And this time, we got a banshee. Brother, uh. Not what I had hoped for, but progress nonetheless. After cleaning and lubricating the rails and belts, tightening the heat brake, calibrating the extruder, and taking a slight detour to make a sick breakout board with sample name. Thank you so much, sample name. This makes it so much easier to build. I would not build one without it anymore. And thank you, PCBWay, for providing the manufacturing service. As always, the quality is beyond comprehension. I began to see all my hard work pay off. And print a perfect benchy. Oh boy, oh boy, here it is. Look at that. First look. Wow. Let's take a closer look at the sample prints. I noticed they have a lot of stringing. So although I went ahead and filmed a bunch of time lapses, I did go back afterwards and try turning off Z-Hop and that fixed the stringing right up. Confused, I posted on the Positron Discord asking why the Orca profile for the Positron had Z-Hop. Surprisingly, that profile isn't optimized at all with Nomad saying it was unfinished and slow and they intend to improve it a bunch but haven't had the time. I'm tuning in to their tuning updates and I'll keep you posted with their progress. I'll admit, maybe I was too quick to give up on the 3D printed bed holders. I think that I just had more rigidity in mind than is really needed. So I'll definitely give that another go before the next video as well. Oh yeah, and in the last video, I had mentioned that I was trying to undercut the Positron V3.2, which came in at $6.99. Well, what progress have I made towards that goal? Well, a fully built Limitron will set you back $413. Whoa. If you like where this is heading, please use some of that cost reduction and support my Patreon. Let's take a second to talk about portability and the two screws that attach the Z-axis. Clearly, this isn't good for portability because you're gonna need a screwdriver to take it apart and put it back together. Later, I plan to make the Z-axis fold, just like the brilliant Z-axis on the Positron V3.2. That means thumb screws won't be necessary. So, it's a bit like when Tesla went ahead and removed the ultrasonic sensors. I just don't want you to go buy thumb screws if you're not gonna use them in the end. Let's talk about what's left before the upcoming open source release. I had mentioned the nearly overheating extruder motor. I mean, it works, but there's no margin there. It's one degree from buckling the filament at any time. This will be solved in maybe two ways or just one. The most interesting way, but also the more optional one, is to fix the bad gear ratio by using a reduction gear. Obviously, the current design has its simplicity, but there's no denying the mechanical advantage of gears, which would cut the heat in half. The other fix, which I'm definitely doing, like right after this video, is to add an air channel around the extruder motor and remove the current exhaust port in the top plates and exhaust the air around the motor instead. Uh, actually, I'm just going to add an air channel on all of them for good measure. Like I said, the current design is on the edge of acceptable and that means we only need a slight improvement, but I'll certainly give both a shot. In the last video, I introduced the idea of a filament spool underground, which would be an accessory that the Limitron would sit on, lifting it up and providing it with one roll of filament always ready on the go. I've been focused on the printer, so this accessory will just have to come later because it doesn't need to exist for you to enjoy your very own Limitron. One more loose end is definitely the option to provide external DC power, which has been on my mind since the beginning. I would have put it in much earlier, but I don't know what DC boost converters or batteries van lifers use. But one thing is for sure, this is the one true definitive printer for van lifers. So if any of you are out there, please give me your thoughts over on the Voxelite server. But in the meantime, you can use it with an inverter. Like many of you, I have this accelerometer, so all I have to do in theory is put mounting holes on the tool head and poke a hole in the chassis for the USB. 
this is going to be one of those printers where the accelerometer does not live on the tool head but is simply attached when calibrating and removed as needed. I also need to finish the website, which means finalizing the bomb and documenting every single screw and making an assembly video. The website is also hopefully going to set a new standard for 3D printer builds with detailed information and hand holding so that your new build can be deeply satisfying on a personal level. And I want to make sure that some of the drudgery of software configuration is as streamlined as possible. As usual, I'll leave you with a build video so you can see what it's like to build a Limitron. Very first thing, always the AC jack, screwing it in. And then I'll grab this absolutely monstrous pile of guts and I'll just route it around snapping the motors. I'll flip it and I will secure the Raspberry Pi risers which also cinch down on the SKR Pico holding it all in place. We gotta push down these wires to make sure that they don't snag when we put the top plates on. Now we can screw in the fans but only the bottom two screws because we're waiting for the mid plates which we're adding now and we're routing the wires through the mid plates. Now we'll screw the motors to the motor mounts and then there's two screws to help attach the mid plates to the unibody and then we can finally add the other fan screws. And this is my favorite part. Without dropping the balls I can slide in the rail just like that and cinch it down with all of these screws. And then I'll add these two idler pulleys and then two more at the bottom and they have longer screws so they screw the whole thing together. Add a few more screws for good measure. Screw in that rail and then we're gonna route the belts. Another belt routing speed run. And once again it comes time to button it all up with the top plates. And now we got the Limitron tool head. From underneath we attach the belt to the tool head using these two screws. Next up we're gonna push the edge connector into the bracket. Just tug on the braided sleeve a little bit and then we'll attach it to the carriage. Then we'll twist the lead screw in a bit before tightening the grub screws on the pulley. Can't forget the belt Z idler before finally attaching the last two screws. Besides these thumb screws which attach the bed forks. Slotting in an edge connector bed will finish up the build. Can you say printer? <laughs> Holy crap, what a long video. Um, there was a lot to say. A lot to go over and Limitron just had so many changes and it's never been better. Um, this is my first project that I'm going to really publish. Uh, so please cheer me on on Patreon and uh, maybe subscribe. And yeah, I can't wait to release it. It's going to be amazing and a huge accomplishment for me. So thanks guys. See ya.